So we are in a part two of the God of the Vineyard. Amen. Uh, you can cast this uh, the part one on our uh, on our web page at squadcc.org or on our YouTube page so you guys can remain caught up. Uh, as I was going through this and just kind of meditating on it uh, through this week and even today, you know, the, it's good not to miss these things for this reason. I try to preach this gospel in Mark in a way that is a continuation, right? It's a story that's being built up. It is the good news, amen? So when you miss one and you cast like a part two, you know, you're missing part of the story, right? So I kind of go into it and just kind of keep it going until we're done with the whole book of Mark. But thank God for our editor back there who edits the videos, puts them on our webpage or on YouTube. How many people been on YouTube and watch some of the, the videos on there, amen? Praise God, right? And so it's a good way to catch up, stay caught up, so that when we come together on Sundays, we all can be on the same page, amen? And then feel free to pass that thing out to anybody else who needs to hear the word of the Lord. And so today we are on part two, the God of the vineyard. I don't know if we may have a part three, but let the Spirit of God lead, amen? And so in saying that, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord. That we are able to come in, have pre-service, God, hear an encouraging word, Lord God, from my brother uh, Jesse, Lord God, who gave the word about wrestling, God. We thank you, God, that uh, you wrestle with us, God. You allow us to encounter you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for, for worship time, that we're able to praise and worship you, Lord God. And, uh, and we give you glory for that, God. And that is the only time that we're able to give out to you, God, and, and, and praise and worship you, God. And now... Here we are about to hear your word, God, another time of our service that we receive from you. And so I pray, God, that we will receive it deep down inside our hearts. I pray that your word will be a double-edged sword, God, piercing uh, to the dividing soul, joint, and marrow, God, to be produced change from within us that is seen outside of us, God. May we be doers of your word and not just hearers deceiving ourselves. Have your way, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. Let's give it up for Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you can open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, verse 1 through 12, the word of the Lord says, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the, for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some uh, farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send. Somebody say, one left. He had one left to send a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then would the, would the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, and they left him and went away. And so here it is, we have Jesus Christ starting to give parables again, which he paused for a time in order to intently teach his disciples before he went to the cross and ultimately died, to which he was still on his way on now. It's Tuesday of Passion Week, and Jesus is taking steps closer to the cross to which he will die upon. And so as he's doing this, now having to deal with everybody else and continue to teach, he brings up parables again. And he starts to teach in parables as he did in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And he does it for a reason, so to allow the individuals, those who have ears to hear, let them hear, right? 
eyes to see, let them see. You would have to be intently listening, intently watching Jesus Christ to understand these parables. Now, this particular parable was a different one than he gave in the past. This one was a parable of judgment. It was a parable letting the people know what is to come. It was a parable of warning. A parable that would either lead you to repentance out of the fear of the Lord or a parable that will lead you into pride to rebel against the Lord and ultimately be destroyed. And so all of us are faced with this kind of decision on a day-to-day basis. We're faced with the fact of, am I going to choose to obey God and honor him? Or am I going to choose to rebel against God and disobey him and ultimately lead to our own demise? This is a question that we have to ask ourselves every day. It's a question of, when I wake up, am I going to still be a Christian today? Or because I don't feel like it, eh, I'll save that for Sunday. I'll save it for Wednesday in front of everybody, right? I'll ask questions, I'll give answers, make it seem like I'm in tune, make it seem like I'm actually honoring God, make it seem like I'm actually cultivating the vineyard of God. But in reality, I really don't care. I'm just doing me, I'm just trying to save face, right? All of us went through those kind of things, but today, God is trying to warn us before it's too late. There's so many prophecies happening right now around the world that it will blow our mind. Even one to happen and come to pass, it's zero to what, a million or trillion, whatever they said, right? For even one prophecy to come about. And there's prophecies now happening all around us from the one world church, right, or religion, quote unquote, right, that already been signed in in September, right, to all the other things that are going on right now in this country and in the Middle East that all points to the coming of Jesus Christ. And now he's given us warnings today. Repent. Repent. Because when I come back, I'm not coming back to play patty cake. I'm not coming back to save anybody. I'm coming back to literally kill all my enemies and those who rejected me. And then this parable is a parable of judgment because he gives the answer to the people. He says, what what will the owner of the vineyard do? And he answers it. He will come and kill those people. He didn't say, I'm going to come and just talk to them to death. I'm going to come and preach another message. I'm going to come back in the manger, you know, as a baby. I'm going to do it all over again and die for them. No, he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to kill them. You see, I don't know about you guys, but that is a threat from God Almighty. And as we know and read the Bible as Christians, that is a promise of God. When I come back, I am coming back to kill. And see, we don't like to talk about Jesus like that, right? Nobody wants to hear that about Jesus. We want to hear not Jesus is loving. He's not going to kill nobody, pastors. Just stop playing. You're doing too much. Don't be trying to scare us now. Come on, man. He's going to come back. He's going to look at us. He's going to have mercy because he loves us so much, and he's the God of love, and he's going to let everybody in. Stop playing Stop playing games. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to hell. Come on. That will make God so mean and so evil. Well, that is the Bible that we read, and this is the Jesus that I'm talking about, and I don't know what Jesus you pray to, but I pray to the Jesus that's coming back on a white horse with a scepter in his hand and has fire in his eyes. And with his mouth, he will say, be dead, and you are dead. That is what he's going to do. And after that, we're going to ride off into the sunset on horses with him in Jesus' name. And the thing is, like, sometimes like, we talk about this stuff, and it's like, dude, you're talking about Superman next, you know, the next Superman coming out. Like, stop playing, dude. This is real stuff. And I think, you know, because we have Marvel Comics and all these other things, I think the intent of that is for the enemy to try to, just like he did with violence and everything else, desensitize us. And to think, dude, that's just fairy tale stuff. Come on, even to the point that we would, many people will even say, man, they've been saying Jesus is going to come back since the 80s, man. Since the, for so long, he still ain't come back. People still acting crazy. It's getting worse. He still ain't coming back. Come on, man, stop playing with that. The Bible says he's going to come and catch people as a thief in the night. Think about a thief in the night. They ain't going to tell you, hey, dude, I'm going to come. I'm going to break into your car. I'm stealing your rims, right? Taking your sounds if you have it. Just want to let you know, be ready for me. I'm coming about 10 o'clock. No, a thief comes, don't even tell you, wake up and your car is on crates, your rims are gone that you spent all your income tax on, and your stimulus check and all this other stuff, right? And it's all gone. If you would have known dude was coming, you would have been ready in the the gangway, right? Whatever. And so this is the thing. God is warning us. And I don't know about you guys, but we need to take God's warnings very, very seriously. Amen? Last week, we talked about the long-suffering of God. I'm not going to get too much into this. 
But we talked about long-suffering, meaning patiently enduring, lasting offense, or hardship. We had some scripture that came from Isaiah 5. The reason why I use this scripture because it breaks down all the characters within this parable. It lets us know that the owner of the vineyard was God the Father. It lets us know that all the service that, that God the Father sends to try to warn the people and try to find faithfulness and good fruits from them, in which they didn't find, they were the prophets of the Old Testament. And then it comes down to now going into the part that we're going to get into today. It talks about the gospel of God. And this gospel, hallelujah, the gospel of God is the Father sending the Son into the vineyard, right? Into the world, into this very place we call earth, meaning dirt. He sends him here to earth to try to find faithfulness here, to try to go to these religious leaders and these people, because it wasn't just the religious leaders. It was the people of God, even going against God himself, still claiming to be the people of God. When you read the Old Testament, it's not, it's not that different than what's happening today in the 21st century. In the Old Testament, you had the people of God as well as the religious leaders of God that were appointed to govern the people of God, all being rebellious and going against God himself while still calling themselves the people of God. It was still happening. They were doing things their own way. They had idols. They lifted up money. They did their own thing. They had, they created their own quote unquote scriptures. It was progressive then. Everybody was in it. If you were too much of a radical, they would literally just kill you. They would wipe you out. Why do you think they killed the prophets of old? The service that God sent beforehand to warn them and to tell them, repent before X, Y, and Z happens, before you get destroyed. And they took those people outside of the gate and they killed them. Some of them they beat. Some of them they drove out. What do you think is happening today? It is the very same thing happening. That were the people of God, now they call themselves Christians, right? Now Christians who are now growing up in this progressive mindset, right, who are changing the word of God. I don't want to hear about rebukes. I don't want to hear about all that correction. Please don't confront me. Don't do none of that stuff. I'm going to call it control, right, because that's what it is. It's control. You're trying to control me now. And it's like, dude, I just called you to tell you I love you, man, if you're still serving Jesus. How is that control, right? And so they add all these other things in there, and when they see a radical Christian or a radical church like Squad Community Church, whoa, y'all doing too much. Y'all in a cult. Y'all doing too much. It is the same thing that was happening then. And they killed these people. And yet even after they killed them, listen to this, they still said they were the children of God. Even afterwards, they said they were doing God a favor. Too radical. Grab Isaiah, we learned last week, and saw him in two. Saw him in two. We're not talking about the Saw movie, right? Fake stuff, right? Fake blood. No, it looks real. It's horror, whatever it is. They grabbed the man of God, Isaiah, right? I would imagine they had to hold him down, tie him down, and grab a saw, right? Y'all know what a saw is, right? Saw, right? And, I mean, just to think, the kind of hate you have to have for somebody to saw them in two? That's not like, you know, it's one thing like shoot somebody, bow, run, right? Don't even know. I don't even see him. He's just gone. He's out of, out of sight, out of mind. But to sit there and literally just chew, 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 chew. You know how long that takes to do that? You have to really, really hate this person. They saw this man in two. His own people, the religious leaders, saw him in two. He was giving the word of the Lord. And they thought he was an enemy of God. And they killed him. Because he wasn't speaking the same tune they were. They did. They killed and went against Elijah. They did the same thing with Jeremiah. Took him out. And now Jesus continues to talk about this parable. And you can just, if you're a human being, any human beings in the house? Hallelujah. You can literally hear this story and put yourself in a situation as the owner or the father, and just feel the anger. Because it was wrong what was going on. If you love justice, you're going to hate the fact of what they were doing. If you love justice. Because if they were doing it to one of your family members, I'm sure you're going to be protesting. I'm sure you're going to be out, this ain't right. They done killed my husband, they done next You're going to be out there protesting. They took my whole business. I sent my manager over to go try to get them some of the profit, and I kept the money, kicked him out, whipped him, and they told him to just keep the whole business that I started. 
I created that business. Nobody's just going to sit on the sidelines and be like, don't worry about it. Send about 14 more servants. And they killed all of them. And so here it is, the gospel of God in our lesson, a uh, second point of our lesson. And it's in verses 6 through 8. This is the word it says. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And look at why they want to kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. They wanted to take everything for themselves. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. This is Jesus giving prophecy of what's about to happen to himself only a few days later by these same people who would judge him to death to be crucified on a rugged cross. Jesus continues with this parable to add the owner of the God or the God of the vineyard had one left to send. Somebody say one left. It was a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, meaning no one is greater than him and no one will come after him. It is very important to understand the statement that Jesus made right here. Very important to apologetics, very important to Christianity, very important to the Holy Bible, very, very important because of this reason. This excludes Muhammad, who they claim to be the last prophet. Think about that. Jesus gave the prophecy, and he says he had one left to send, meaning there's nobody else to send. There's no other gospel. There's no one else. There's not going to be other prophets after him creating a different gospel. There is nobody else. There is only one left to send, and it was a son whom he loved. And the Bible says he sent him last of all, meaning nobody after him, no one, just Jesus. This rules out Muhammad as a false prophet, number one, and the Quran as a lie. We're getting dirty today. Can we talk about it? Hallelujah. This excludes Joseph Smith and Mormonism, who claimed a different gospel. This excludes Charles Taze Russell, founder of Jehovah Witnesses, and anyone else who came after Jesus claiming a final or accurate quote-unquote gospel because God the Father sent the last one and only one left, and his name is Jesus the Christ who brought grace and truth. That is the God we serve. We don't have to be worried about, but what about all the other religions? They come under. If they came after Jesus, they ain't talking about nothing. What about, you know, Buddha and, and trying to get enlightenment and all that stuff? Now, they got that from the Bible. Well, what about peace and everything else? No, we serve the Prince of Peace. We, did not, we ain't trying to look for peace. We had the one who is called peace. What about love? He is love. He is not a form of love. He is not a, some kind of love. No, Jesus Christ is love. He is peace. He's the one who enlightens us. There is no one else. There's nobody else. And no one else will come. It's just Jesus. And so, the God of the vineyard said, they will respect my son. This was not saying that God the Father did not know what they were going to do or a display of naiveness or lack of omniscience. Rather, to add more emphasis to the long suffering of the God of the vineyard, who in love gave his one and only son, whom he loved, to collect or, for that matter, die for those same people who killed their servants before him. We see in this the long suffering of God. We see the gospel being preached out through this parable because the one that was before them telling them this very parable was the son of God in their face. And they said, man, they then said they're going to kill the son to take the inheritance. And who would have known? They didn't know. But a few days later, they would be putting, putting to death and killing the very son whom the father sent into the vineyard. And then they will bury him outside of the gates. And so this gives us the gospel of God. Nevertheless, the tenants in their stubbornness and selfish hearts, hardened by sin, darkened by lust for control, prestige, and self-gratification, killed the son and threw him outside the very vineyard he created and owned. Jesus ascribed and told of the gospel of God who would send his one and only son to die for an unworthy people in which Jesus was headed and getting over or getting ever closer to that rugged cross. Oh, what gospel of God 
that tells us of the heart of the God of the vineyard who offers his one and only son to die for the vineyard he made so that they can be forgiven. I want us to contemplate on the scandalousness of the gospel of God. It's something that we cannot contemplate. It's something that Jews still to this day cannot contemplate. You had that dude, Ben Shapiro. He's a Jew. Awesome dude. Knows a lot of things. Know how to debate. Things like that. And I heard a, a, uh, 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 an interview with him the other day between him and John MacArthur. And so in the video, John is, you know, John is giving him the gospel, giving the gospel. And then Ben Shapiro probably heard the gospel so many times. He responds and literally he was on point with the gospel. He even said it sounded like good news. But you know what stopped him? His own pride. He acknowledged the fact that he was a sinner. But then the moment he went there, he then turns gears and he says, but that is why I'm taking ownership of my own sins. So that I can go to heaven because I'm going to pay for them. He didn't even know what he, was, what he realized what he was saying. He didn't understand you can never pay for those sins by his own. Because the moment you try to change and do anything, your hands that are stained with the very sin you're taking ownership of can never be removed by any good works of your own. No matter how many debates and how many people you debunk and no matter how much you stand for justice and everything else, none of it, none of it will wipe away his hands of the stain of sin. It is only the blood of Jesus, and he just couldn't understand that. He couldn't understand why God the Father would send his one and only son to die for a wretched people. Who would do that? Who would do such a thing? Who would create such a scandalous plan as the gospel of God? Who would come up with that craziness? I'll tell you who. It was God himself, the owner of the vineyard. And when you really contemplate on this thing called the gospel, you would really recognize how, 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 how unfortunate we were and how fortunate Jesus was that he came into this world. Now think about all the sin you have done until this point. Think about the sin you did last night. We're not going to go into details of that, but you know it. Think about all the sins, right? And think about the fact that you ask God to forgive you. Think about the fact that we get to today as, as Derry gave uh, communion. My wife was talking about it, right? And how the fact of it was not a bad, it's not a somber time, but it's a privileged time. It's a grateful time of communion because communion is a reminder that I was saved by grace through faith and that not of myself. It was the blood of the loving Jesus Christ that took my place, that even though I sinned last night, he allowed me to wake up the next day, come to church. I get to be in church, right? I get to come to church and I get to partake in communion, not because I'm holy, but because he's holy and took my place. And I can be reminded that by his blood and by his body, I can receive for the very forgiveness that I needed last night and even need this morning. And that God doesn't say, well, because you sinned last night, because you sinned this morning, I'm not going to forgive you. No, he says, I'm ready to forgive you. As long as you recognize who is the only one that can forgive you and bring cleanse into your life. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. The only blood. And it is blood that removes sins. Not your blood because our blood is, is not holy. It is unholy. It is impure. It needed the pure, unblemished blood of God himself. And God says, don't worry about it. I got a plan and it's called the gospel of God. It's good news because in this good news, you don't have to go on the cross. I'm going for you. When we recognize the fact of the gospel of God and the scandalous of it, that every day I walk in sin, every day I make mistakes, every day I sin some way, I do not deserve to live, let alone go to heaven. I deserve hell itself. If we're honest with ourselves, we deserve hell itself. But then God steps in and says, listen, I made a way. God, what is that way? I'm going to die for you. What? No, 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 You know, because it's hard for us, especially men, to receive things from other people, especially another man. Like, do you gonna pay my rent? No, man, no. Like, I'm good. I'm good. I was watching a video on, on, on YouTube. It was uh, this white gentleman. He had car issues, man. He was definitely mad as ever. And he's fixing his car again, right? Reminds us of one of the brothers in, in Christ in our church, right? Fixing his car again. Putting all this money into it, right? And after some time, it gets frustrating. Come on, somebody, right? You putting all this money, whatever, this thing constantly breaking. I don't even know how to work on cars, but I'm gonna try my hardest, cut myself, spray myself with fuel, all type of stuff happening, right? Man, frustrated. There was a Christian 
who comes up to him and says, hey, man, how, how you doing? How's your day going? And I tell you that, this dude's face looked at him like, like he's in his car. He looked at him like, I ought to stick you in this car for asking me that question. Do you see what I'm doing right here? And so he's like, well, how you doing? He's like, man, you already know how life is. I'm trying to fix my car again. Broke down again. So, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that, man, you know? I'm sorry to hear that. Like, what's going on? It's like, I don't know. I'm fixing it again. I got kids at the house, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, look, man, like, uh, man, I want to bless you, man. And he's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, look, I want to. I want to give you this, this money. And he pulled out, I think it was like $1,000 or something like that, right? Definitely needed that $1,000. Y'all pull out $1,000 for me? To me, I'm grabbing it. No, there's no question asked. I'm taking it. Thank you, man. God bless you real good, okay? And so, but he stood there. The first thing he does is this. No, man, I can't take that. Why is that our first inkling? Because another man is trying to do something good to another man or a person. And the first thing we do, no, man, I don't, no, I can't take that. I can't take that. You know what, I, I, I think it's definitely pride, but let's make it even more plain. I think because we know we don't deserve it. You see, Jesus Christ comes in the gospel of God, and he knows all your sin, and he catches you under the hood of sin for some of us, literally. Literally catches you right there. Like, God, you got to walk in my, in my, my closet right now? You got to really do this right now? Walk in my living room right now? You know I got, you know I got, you know I, you know I got Michelle right here. Come on, God. And he walks right there like, son, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, 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 whatever, right? Like, oh, what's happening? And he comes right there, right in the midst. You're in your head, head in, under the hood of sin. And he convicts your life right there. He said, I'm the God of the universe. I created you in my image and my likeness. I love you. And you're like, oh, God, you already know. I'm dealing with the sin. I'm struggling, God. It's hard, God. Because he asks us that question, how are you doing, son? How you doing, daughter? God, you already know. And he's trying to tend to comment those times we've been arguing with the wife or the, the husband, right? We know we just threw something at one of the kids. Oh, he's lucky I missed him. We're just right in our, right in our run. We're so tired of this. And we're wherever our comfortable spot's at in the house, sitting on the recliner, lazy, but whatever it is. And we're mad as ever. And then the Spirit of God just wants to visit us right there. Son, how you doing? Remember that Devo you did at 6 in the morning? Yeah, I set this whole thing up so I was hoping you could apply it, but you failed, and it's okay. But here I am to tell you that I love you. Yeah, I know you, you hit your kids out of anger. One of them is bruised, right? I know you kicked the dog out. It hasn't been in three days. Whatever it is, right? Your wife's sitting on the couch or sleeping on the couch, whatever it is. But he steps in, and he says, I have something for you. What you got for me, God? I got forgiveness for you. No, God, come on, God, I can't, I can't take that right now, God. I can't take it right now, God. You don't understand what I just did. You don't understand what I did five years ago. You don't understand what I just did last year. God, you don't even understand what I did New Year's Eve, and then I went into a fast. You don't understand, God. I can't take that. I can't take that. The reason why we can't take it, because we recognize we don't deserve it. But this is what Jesus did, the scandalous of the gospel. I still have it here for you. I know you don't deserve it. I know you can never work for this. I know this is beyond you. But guess what? I did it just for you. I did it just for you. I sent my son knowing that he was going to go back to this vineyard and they were going to kill him just like they killed all the other ones I sent before them. But yet I still sent him. Not because they deserved it or didn't deserve it. I sent him because that was my plan to ultimately save them from the very sin that binds them. I came to deliver them. I came to set them free. I came to give them the gospel. And the first thing we do is I don't accept it. Or on the other end, we try to take advantage of it. Because there's another side of the coin as well. You see, these individuals, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they, didn't, they were not like, oh, man, no, we don't deserve it. No, no, no. no. Instead, they said, bro, this is the son He's the heir. Let's kill him, throw him out of the vineyard, and take everything. So the question then comes down to it is this. How do we look at Jesus, the son? 
Do we come at him in pride and self-abasement and say, God, oh, I, can't, I can't accept the forgiveness, God. I'm going to try to work it on my own. And he's like, listen, there is no other means of salvation. You can never work for this. You can only accept it and receive it and let it change you from the inside out. But on the other end, we can do this. Oh, I'm going to take advantage of this. Oh, I see a come up. Oh, yeah, I see a way to get all the stuff I want to get. All I got to do is pray. Oh, I, I, see, I see an opportunity to get, you know, to get some prestige under my belt. I see a way to take advantage of some people. I see a way to lift up myself in self-glorification, do some work around the church that people clap for me. Oh, I see a way to really take advantage, to try to sneak my way into heaven and say, God, I'm going to do this prayer. Yeah, oh, God, of course, I, I accept your forgiveness, God. Thank you, God. Yes, God. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, I will. And go right back to the very sin that only proves you never repented at all. You never accepted Jesus at all. It's not to say you're never going to be sinless, but it is to say we ought to be sinning less. Amen? And so God is calling us to the gospel of God. And he's asking us a question. How do you accept the son that I have sent? How have you treated his blood? How have you treated his sacrifice, his body? Do you just take advantage of it? Come and go as you please with it? Only call out to Jesus when it's very bad and somebody done said the D word and it's divorce out there and all of a sudden it's like, oh, snap, I got to get it right. Or somebody's threatening to leave or some crazy is happening and now, oh, God, God, I remember you. God, I'm going to come to church early every single Sunday. God, I'm going to be there Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, God. Lord, I'm going to be there every day, God. Uh, just come through, God. Just please come through, God. And we use God. And then once the dust settles... We just kill him again. And we walk away. And say, God, I'll be back my next season. You got me back on the mountain high. That's all I want. I just wanted to see above the clouds. And yep, I see that my future is glorious up here, baby. Car coming this way, house over here, white fence, my two-tone it, whatever it is, right? Clothes, job, work. Oh, I got a career going on. It's looking real good up here, Lord. Thank you, God. I'm making all this money. But now that I'm on the, mount the mountain tots where you got me, God, no intention of going back to the valley lows, God. And so therefore, God, I'll meet you at the next valley low. When I end up going back there, and I'll call upon your name. But as long as I'm on the mountain tops, God, don't really need you right now. And so, God, I'll call you next time. This is how we treat the Son of God, the blood that was spilled for all of us. And Scripture has a lot to say about that. Amen. A lot to say. And we're going to get into this. Oh, what a gospel. The gravity of such a parable was understood up until the point by the very killers and tenants, the religious people, were that, were that in Matthew 21, 41, this is what happened in Matthew 21, 41. Listen to this. After Jesus asked them, what will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants? He asked, and Mark, uh, Jesus answers the question. But before he answered it, and Matthew's account, it says that the tenants answered the question. The religious people answered the question for him because they were so infuriated and so mad that this is what they said. They replied with heartfelt indignation and a, and a, and a supposed self-righteous anger. He will bring those uh, wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Yet they trampled the son that was given for their sins and the blood he shed. You see, it's so easy to look at everybody else and be like, God, kill him. Definitely kill her. I'm so tired of this stuff. Kill her. Kill him. Stupid old dude over there. Never want to listen. Definitely kill him, God. Kill him first. And then she's trying. Wait till later. And, it's, and we're, we're good. We don't want to look at self, but we'll look at everybody else. And we can talk for hours. Come on, this, can we be honest in church? We should be honest every other time, but especially in church, right, I guess, right? According to y'all's, yes. And so the thing is this, we are so fast to talk about somebody else's failures and what they're doing or not doing. It is so easy to like hear this story, just like the religious leaders who are actually the ones killing everybody, because in their ancestry, they killed all the prophets. Look in Acts. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And so to sit there, it's easy to talk about everybody else. Look at them. Got their kids looking all crazy. Look at them. Marriage all jacked up. Look at this. Look at that. Never want to come to church. Never want to do this. Unfaithful, uncommitted. Look at them. And it's easy to talk about everybody else and be like, God, I can't wait till you teach them a lesson. 
And then for those who are just not Christians, like, ah, oh, look at them. Some of them are our neighbors, live on the first floor. They live in our next door house or whatever. Look at them, a bunch of sinners. They got the, 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 the gay flag out there. Oh, God, I can't wait you come back and you show them the real light and destroy them all. See, some of us don't say that out loud, but we say that in our hearts. But we never listen to what God says afterwards. You notice that? We never listen to the still small voice that says, why do you think I had you live next to them? You were supposed to be the light to them so they can repent. Why do you think I had you move there? Why do you think I put these employees next to you? Why do you think I did X, Y, and Z? Why do you think I allowed you to see them? Why do you think, why do you think, why do you think? But we're so, so busy talking about everybody else and what they're doing and not doing that we forgot to, what are we doing and not doing? You see, they forgot about what they were doing or not doing that when there was time to respond in that question, oh, they responded from a self-righteous heart that beat inside their heart with anger and indignation that they said, man, he will come back and I hope he does and he's going to kill those wretched people. And then he's going to give that land and rent it to somebody else. And then guess what happens? In Luke's account, they realize, wait a minute, he's talking about us. And in Luke's account, they said, Lord, may it never be. May it, may it never be. The answer that we just gave, may it never be that. But they weren't repenting. It was still that fox old prayer. God, please, I don't want to go to hell. God, I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want to do these things. Oh, but give me a chance. God, I'll try to take you out first. And so the son is standing before them just like he's standing before us. And for us, he's already standing with the, with the nails that were in his hands. And he's standing with the scars of the crown of thorns on his head and his beard was ripped out and he had all the slashes on his back and his, his back was shredded. His skin is just hanging there. He has a side wound. Remember when, when he came back from resurrection, he came to Doubting Thomas and he, Doubting Thomas said, I will not believe unless I can see and touch it. And he came to Doubting Thomas and he said, Thomas, put your fingers inside the hole of my side. That means that he still had, he had a resurrected body that still had the scars that was given to him by mankind you see it's easy to say man man those bogus old roman soldiers those bogus old religious people those leaders what they did to jesus but you gotta ask the question god why does jesus if he has a glorified body because i'm hoping to have hair I'm just gonna let you guys know right i go to heaven i get a glorified body god give me hair back i want to look like fabio now because i don't have no hair on the earth just let it just whew, just kind of like go in there, right? Just right, braid it, whatever, right? And so like some Thor stuff, right? So, so it's like, God, okay, he has a glorified body. We're supposed to have a glorified body. I'm thinking, God, everything is going gonna, gonna to be new, right? New hair, whatever, right? I can choose my color, whatever it is, right? All this stuff, no scars, nothing. It's a glorified body, right? But then we ask the question, God, why did you keep Jesus you gave him a glorified body, resurrected from the dead. How many people believe that? Amen. If you don't, I don't think you're saved, okay? So you got a glorified body. It's supposed to be all made new. But why did you keep Jesus with the scars on his hands and feet and the, the wound on the side? This is what I believe. It's so that we can see what he did for us. You see, we're going to be in eternity with Jesus Christ, and he's still going to have those scars. And every time we look upon the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, the only son, the last one left, that God sent into the vineyard, and we killed him. And he comes to Thomas, and he says, Thomas, put your fingers into the hole to where I was stabbed at. And he was able to put his fingers inside the hole by his ribs. And he believed instantly, oh, my Lord and my God. You see, it's one thing to say they killed him. It's another thing to take ownership and say, no, it was I who killed him. Because every sin that I have ever done up until this point, and even the ones we're doing tonight and tomorrow, put him on that cross and killed him. That is the gospel of God. And his thorns and his hands and in his feet 
and the spear that went to his side and the crown of thorns on his, on his head is a reminder of what he did for humanity, what he did for you and I. It is the most scandalous gospel because in the end, I believe that we'll still look at him until we get that glorified body and still say, I don't deserve it, God. And I, it's hard to accept. It's hard to even look upon you, God. Because the reality is, is that we don't deserve it. And that's what makes the gospel so scandalous. Because when we think about all the sins that we have done, all the things that we have done, and yet this Jesus forgives us every single day. You see, it's not that we're never sinning again. Come on. It's the fact that we still sin. And this Jesus who died for us comes and he still loves us. And he still forgives us. And he still has mercy on us. And he still teaches us and shows us the very gospel of God. But just like we learned last week, see that long suffering will run out because one day we will have to give an account for the very rebellion that we did against God himself. Can we see what the Bible says about that? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 on down. Buckle your seatbelts. If we deliberately keep on doing what? Sinning. After we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire, talking about hell, that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses did without mercy and the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves? Listen to that word deserves to be punished, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them. Notice the word them. Who is he talking to? Yes, them. And who has insulted the spirit of grace. There's that take advantage of grace, right? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge whose people? His people. He's talking about believers here. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so here it is. The chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law standing before the Son of God who they continually reject. And he's giving them this parable of judgment. And they answered the question for himself and Matthew and said, listen, he will come and he will kill those wretched people. He would wipe them out, God. He would take them out. And then he would give and rent the, the, the vineyard to someone else, to some other people. And they were literally admitting out of their own mouths, because they didn't know he was talking about them at the time, the kind of judgment worthy of such a person who called themselves the children of God, the people of God, but who continue to sin and reject the Son of God by their disobedience. They were being disobedient unto God. They were being rebellious unto God. Yet, they considered themselves the people of God. And here is the Son of God, ruler and reigner and sovereign king over all of them, standing in front of him and telling him, yes, he will kill them all. And they still trampled him under their feet only days later. And today, we're dealing with the same thing. Jesus already came. He died. But yet, every time we continue to rebel against him, it's not, listen to me clearly, it's not the fact that we will never sin again. It's the fact that we must become sinless in sinning less and obeying God. It's the fact that we're walking with Jesus and honoring the blood that he gave to us and shed it for us in our sins. It's taking an account of our own hearts and our own lives and asking us this question. Have I truly appreciated and accepted the gospel of God? Or do I just use it as a filthy rag to my own advantage and I take advantage of the spirit of grace? See, grace is unmerited favor, something that we do not deserve. But we can take advantage of it when we lose sight of the very gospel of God and the Son who died for our lives. And all we want is our Willy Wonka ticket to go to heaven. We say, I'm going to do this little prayer with a little magical prayer. 
and I'm going to be good. We have created in our society a Christianity without repentance, a Christianity without the gospel, a Christianity without confrontation, accountability, discipleship. We created a Christianity that only works for the flesh, but does not work until being born again in obedience to God. So we have a hollow Christianity because they removed this Lord. It removed the fact that judgment starts in the household of God. And if it starts with us, how much should we fear the Lord and honor his sacrifice and the blood that was shed for us to say, God, just as you laid down your life, I laid down mine at your feet. We're talking about the gospel. Jesus died for each and every one of us, and yet we dare to trample on his blood and refuse to repent of our sins. And today, the Lord is giving us this parable as a warning unto salvation or a warning unto eternal judgment. It is for this reason Jesus changes gears and he begins to get into the next section of this sermon, which it looks like we're not going to be able to get into, but listen to this. There's a warning coming to believers. And see, we can talk about the world, amen? We're, all of us could. Stupid old world. All they want to do is trample Jesus. All they want to do is create their own little craziness and recreate the image of God and recreate the love of God and recreate all these other things to their own image and to their own likeness and to their own destruction. And it's easy to talk about somebody who doesn't know any better. Let's keep it real. The world is only going to do what the world is going to do, and I can promise you that. They will continue to do what the world continues to do. If you're thinking they're going to act any kind of Christ-like, who are you going to be thinking about that a very long time? They don't even know how to do it. Why do you think Jesus came? But see, what I want to talk to today in this message, the next week we'll go back into the world, talk about the world, meaning. But today I want to talk about us as believers Because when Jesus was addressing these individuals in this section of verse 68, he was talking to so-called believers. You see, it's easy to come to church and keep coming to church. Amen? It's easy to come and sit down like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, and hear a message and just like, eh, walk out, do the same thing, whatever. See, but God is calling us to this warning today. And he's saying to us very directly, what have you been doing with the blood of my son. How have you been treating the body of the Christ? Do we trample it and treat it as nothing? Do we think that somebody else is supposed to come and sacrifice themselves because we're obviously not receiving the one who has come and no one else is coming? You see, we can say a lot of things with our mouths just like they did. And they say, yes, man, God will come back and the fire, that the owner of the vineyard will come back and it will kill them and wipe out those, those wretched people. But what about it when they realize, just like we're, we could realize today, that, man, I thought God was talking about somebody else out there. But wait a minute, he's talking about me? And see, we can find ourselves in a Luke account and say, God, may it never be. Only because we don't want to be destroyed, but we don't want to repent. Or we can say, God, don't let it be, God. Forgive me and give me the strength and grace, God, to be the child of God that I claim to be from my mouth. But may I now begin to do it from my heart. From the fact that you are who you say you are and you would do what you said you would do. You see, he's talking to believers, my friend. And he's giving us again the gospel of God and reminding us what happened in the Old Testament and how we're living under the new covenant, but the new covenant is under the blood of Jesus Christ, the God, man, the Christ, the Messiah. And it's so easy to get so complacent in our walk and in our lives because of the world at large and its temptation and its overtaking of our lives that we can come to church every single Sunday and assume no, he ain't talking about me. No, 
can't be talking about me. I said a prayer, man, a couple years ago. Heck, I said a prayer last night. Can't be talking about me. Heck, I, I believe the Bible says that. All you got to do is believe. I, I believe. Can't be talking about me. But according to these scriptures, he's talking about all of us. He's talking about me. He's talking about you. And the amazing part about this is that we can have an account called the Bible and hear a word like we're hearing today and have the most audacious opportunity that we can ever have in our lifetime to hear the gospel again, to hear the plan of God again in our ears and in our heart today and respond the way we should respond and say, God, I turn from my old life to live a new life in you, God. I know it's not going to be easy. In fact, I know it's going to be hard because I like a lot of things, God. I like sinning. How many people love sinning here? You're lying. If you don't raise your hand, it's okay. Let's just tell you that right now. <laughs> right? I'll be the first one. I love sinning. Come on, somebody, right? It's part of our, our nature. Now, right, we got one, two people raising their hands, right? Y'all love sinning. I'll put you on blast. It's okay. I'll do it for you guys. But we know it's going to be hard because we have a nature that is going against the nature of God. But that is no excuse to trample over the blood of his son. Because part of the new nature that God has given us is a nature that he equips, the Bible says, to live a godly life on this earth. That's what he said. He said, I give you all things to live a godly life. It's in 1 Peter. It's a promise. And so the question I have for you today, the last question, how are you treating the Son of God who died for you? Have you been trampling over his blood? Have you been just kicking his, his body like some people kick rocks, if you will? Nothing. Doesn't mean nothing. Has no significance. Today we have a beautiful opportunity to, ask, to answer the question that God has given us when he said the question, what do you think the owner of the vineyard would do to me? Now, we know he will kill us and kill all his enemies, the Bible says, right? And the Bible says is an enemy of God is one who loves the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's an enemy of God. Obviously, one who rejects God too, right? But it comes in so much subtle ways. But we can answer the question very honestly and very hopeful in the blood of Jesus like this. God, I know your word says that you would kill all those who oppose you, who trample upon your blood and your body, and that it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. But, God, I believe that if I can repent and turn to you, that you would have mercy and that you would save me. And if I dedicate my life to you every single day and walk with you, God, in faith from first to last, that I will be in heaven with you, God. See, the, the religious people, they only stop at, may it never be. Right? Go back and read Luke. May it never be. But after that, they didn't repent. We can say, God, please don't destroy me, God. But give me a little bit more time to sin. But don't destroy me, God. New Year's is coming up. I just, I just, I just know I'm going to fall. So I just, 2023 is my year. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. We don't even know if we're going to make it to 2023. We can die tonight. And so we can be honest with the Lord and be honest with yourself. And saying, God, I want to honor the son in whom you loved and sent for me. I want to turn from my wicked ways, God. And I want to walk with you in this walk called Christianity. A follower of Jesus Christ. I don't want to just sit here and say, God, may it never be. Please don't destroy me. And then after that, what did they do? When they figured it out, he was talking about them. They said, let's kill this fool. Let's find a way to arrest him. Let's kill him. So instead, they had an opportunity to repent. And they said, Lord, may it never be. God, please, don't destroy me. 
Oh, but let me get my hands on you and I will destroy you. And we don't realize that every time we walk in disobedience, every time we trample over the blood, every time we kick the body in which he gave for our for a sacrifice for us, we're doing the same thing. The Bible says it's as witchcraft, as we talked about before. It's as witchcraft. It's treason. It's rebellion. And so it's on us to respond and receive the gospel for what it is. Oh, yes, it's scandalous. Oh, yes, we don't deserve it. Oh, but oh, thank you, Jesus, that you give me an opportunity to accept it.